He was turning the car away from the high street where Christmas hung like icicles above the shops when the phone started to ring. With a curse and a cursory glance in the mirrors, he set about disentangling himself from the rush of traffic he just waited five minutes to force himself into. Horns competing with one another for hostility and duration threatened to obscure the mobile's tinny fanfare, and by the time he managed to pull up beside the sea wall, they had. It had fallen silent. He'd missed the call. And simply because he had, he knew just who it would have been. Marshall groaned as he dug in his coat slung on the passenger seat to drag out the phone and reward himself with a sight of his ex-wife's name, glaring just as silently and disapprovingly as she'd used to do in their later years together. He caught his reflection in the rearview mirror. No matter how age ravaged him, it never seemed to take much for him to revert to feeling as inept and guilty as a child. Hating his weakness, he turned away from his own gaze to stare at the black void beyond the promenade and summoned up his ex-wife. She'd only just called him, so presumably making him wait so long before answering his call was some kind of punishment, and he had a feeling it was the least of what he was putting himself in for. By the time she answered, as tersely as a slap, he'd broken out into a sweat. Yes, hello, she said. Two words that somehow between them failed to make a greeting. Michelle, sorry, it's me. Her silence could be inviting him to elaborate upon that, though it felt almost totally uninviting. He felt pressured into mumbling, Roger and felt he'd walked into another of her traps when she snapped, I know that. I was beginning to think you didn't want to speak with me. I did earlier. I do now. I was driving. When all of this failed to bring any kind of a response, he asked, Didn't you get my message? I did. That's why I was calling. Her silences were making him itch and squirm as much as her unflinching gazes ever had. He stared out at the cars crawling home along the promenade at the town centre in the rearview mirror closing itself down for the day. A clot of teenagers peeled themselves away from a nearby fish and chip shop and wandered past, pointing and laughing at him. No, not at him, at the car, at the slogans he'd painted onto the doors to advertise himself. What's so important you have to miss your son's birthday? That's hardly fair, he retorted, then blundered on. It's not as if you would have allowed me to take him for long anyway. He has school in the morning. His education is important. I would have thought we both wanted him to grow up to make something of himself. That felt like too much of a dig for him to resist defensively blurting out. I've got work, a job, tonight. He cracked open the window to allow his mounting frustration to escape like steam. A useful excuse to conjure up, Michelle said, and he bit his tongue. At least the teenager's response had been to the slogans, whereas hers was rather more sly. As if he hadn't worried enough over the years how his love of magic tricks had made him seem to others. Though he'd hoped that when he'd ma been made redundant two years ago and tried to make some kind of a living from them, people might take him more seriously. If anything, the reverse seemed to be true, and he tried to believe that he was an entertainer in every sense of the word and didn't need to be taken seriously. It's no excuse, he said simply. It's a good job and it'll give me enough to take the lad out to that pizza place he likes this weekend. Before Michelle could protest either about his presuming he could see Jerry this weekend, or about feeding him junk food, he went on. I wouldn't be much use to him without money now, would I? Perhaps if you were around for him more, then you'd realise he needs more than just presents, Roger. That's a little unfair, he answered, his eyes glued to the clock, feeling like he was being lured further and further into an argument whose sole purpose was to make him late. You know I can't help not working regular hours anymore, and I have to take the work when I can get it, now there's just me.
He hadn't meant that to sound selfish, merely to remind her she now had another man to help her pay off a mortgage on what had used to be their family home, while he'd been relegated to a flat barely big enough for himself, though more than costly enough. Perhaps it had, for she merely asked, And where is it that you're working tonight? Seaport. The Golden Embers Retirement Home. Sounds lively. You might never leave. I'll have to get there first, he replied, determined to be baited no further. I really have to be getting a move on, Michelle. I'm sorry. Don't tell me that. Tell Jerry. Marshall blinked at himself in the mirror. You mean he's there? I thought you would have let me speak to him sooner. No, he's not here. He's out with a friend. I meant when you decide you want to see him again. I do. I will. Tell him... Tell him I love him. I hope you both know that. Tell him I'll call him tomorrow. Tell him happy birthday again. With the call ended, he took a moment to bury the feeling of emptiness he'd been left with and urged himself into some kind of action. The traffic had thinned out enough for him to pick up speed along the seafront, and he took his eyes off the road long enough to claim the A to Z and prop it open on his lap. He and Michelle had met fairly late in life, he supposed, both being at the end of her thirties, and he'd imagined that would have made the relationship more secure. But if anything, it had meant that when it began to crumble, neither had fought for it with a passion of youth. Ten years on, and with a son of almost that age, they'd parted just after he'd been made redundant, and he'd felt exactly that in every way. The old car spluttered through a series of increasingly wider and less traffic-clogged streets, and the clock reminded him how little chance he had of making it on time. With a crowd being elderly, would they be more patient with his lateness, or even forgotten that he was due, or would they be cranky and ready for bed? It was true that most of his gigs were for children's parties, children too old to simply gaze in wonder, and yet too young to remain polite and patient as he struggled to capture their attention, and parents who saw him as little more than a novelty babysitter whilst they fled the room for an hour to pickle their livers. There had been a handful of working men's clubs who seemed to resent him as soon as they saw he hadn't brought an assistant in a bikini, and once a bachelor party where he'd found himself to a warm-up act to a stripper even wearier of it all than he himself was starting to feel, and not much younger, either. He'd never performed for an exclusively aged audience before, but nor had he ever turned a job down. He couldn't afford to, but doubted that a roomful of wrinklies would be the death of him. If he ever got there, he might find out. Two minutes beyond the time he'd agreed to begin, and he was still nosing the car through the slush-covered streets. He was growing increasingly desperate, and about to pull over and call the operator for the number he'd neglected to copy down when the home had booked him, when he saw that the next street was the one he wanted, and the glow he'd at first taken for some kind of belated bonfire was a lit building at the far end. Allowing himself a faint smile of relief, he drove towards it and pulled up outside. Marshall switched the engine off and the home seemed to take a step towards the car. He realised how dark, how silent the rest of the street was. A blessing for the residents, he should imagine. The building was representative of the area, ground detached three or four storey Victorian residences. He let himself quickly out of a car and into his coat, then retrieved his hold all from the boot, full of hopefully all the props he would need to get through the night, especially since he'd cut back on the drinking that had blossomed after his divorce, until he'd realised he was turning into what Michelle imagined him to be. He slammed the boot loudly, as if closing the lid on any more unhelpful thoughts, and without further ado, turned to stride up the hedge-lined path to the front door. The December air had finally sharpened after an unseasonably mild autumn, and there was a smokiness that he normally associated with that time of year. He lined himself up on the step to jab at the doorbell, and barely a second later a light came on and a bulky silhouette jerked forward in the door's glass panel 
He was caught off guard when the door opened slightly and some kind of female face pressed itself into the gap. He was ready to apologise though, whether for his lateness or his stunned expression, he couldn't be sure. But the woman spoke first. Our oh, Mr Marshall, fresh blood, excellent, excellent. You're the one who's come to bring some life to us, aren't you? An arm as thick as his thigh came around the door and swept him into the hallway. He was assailed by a rush of sensations, the dimness of the interior, the dust that coated every surface, the carpets whose patterns would have been unbearably lurid had they not been tamed by age. Just ahead, a winding staircase led up into further gloom whilst various closed doors on this level led to who knew what. The smokiness had followed him inside, but there was also the sense of boiled vegetables, air freshener, furniture polish, the acid tinge of dust, and various layers of further, less identifiable and less pleasant smells. He turned in a slow circle, taking in as much as he could before facing the woman again. She was even bigger than he'd first realised, for she was stood hunched and still loomed above him. Her face was fascinatingly large, seeming to sprout directly from shoulders like cannonballs. Her arms hung down like an ape's, and her body was large and sexless beneath what he assumed was some kind of uniform, but may as well have been a shroud. Have you eaten? Are you hungry? Can we get you anything? No, he answered, resisting the urge to repeat it for each of the questions. If you could just show me to the room where we'll be... Uh, so I can set up. Of course, of course. We have been looking forward to you joining us. There's not much excitement around here these days. You'd think this lot were already dead, I warn you now. Do come and meet the old dears, won't you? They've been waiting for you. That surely needn't strike him as ominous as it did. And he followed the woman's wide white back as she lumbered along the hallway to push open a door at the far end. As soon as Marshall approached, he heard a dozen variously blurred voices chatter into life at once and felt as though he'd disturbed some kind of nest. A nest full of hungry chicks, he thought, as a wrinkled pink faces patched with ash-white hair turned up to him. Eyes squinted or remained unseeing, gnarled fingers clenched on lap blankets, mouths chewed on nothing. Bodies that ranged from obese to skeletal rocked and twitched. Most had paper hats from Christmas crackers perched somewhere on their heads. He wondered if they'd dressed for him. Pudding! A voice as thin as a reed called out. Pudding! Pudding! A blind face turned worm-like towards him. A tiny hand reached out and he stepped back involuntarily, bumping into a woman sat behind the door who chortled at his predicament. A frail man who would have towered to the ceiling if he'd unfolded himself from his armchair grinned down at the floor and mumbled something about still being hot. The large nurse stepped into the centre of a room and commenced slapping her hands together a noise that made him cringe and which eventually seemed to draw whatever attention the residents could muster. Here's our entertainment for the night, everyone, like you've been promised. This is our Mr Marshall and he's got some tricks up his sleeve for us. In a few minutes he's going to perform, so I want you all to make him feel very welcome here, OK? There was a smattering of applause which soon died out amidst general confusion. As he crossed the room to where the nurse was setting up a small folding table beside a Christmas tree so garishly lit it looked like a spaceship, they began discussing him loudly. What's he got up his sleeve? Looks almost ready to be one of us, doesn't he? Is he married? Do you think he'll play with us? Thank you, Marshall said as the nurse left him to arrange the table and left the room. He set his hold all on the floor and extracted a black cloth which he managed to fold into a size appropriate for the tiny folding table. He would usually have set out all his props ready, but there just wasn't space. He arranged everything he would need for the major tricks and left the rest in his hold all for the time being. <laughs> 
He shrugged off his coat to reveal his suit and bow tie, much to the approval of the nearest residents, and he felt ludicrously like some kind of geriatrics stripper. The tall fellow had been right. It was like a furnace in here, or perhaps that was just his nervousness. A small woman, wrapped in shawls like a cocoon, stared at him until he left what he was doing and stepped across to her. Do you have children? She asked, her eyes watery, her skin white as snow. Yes, I have a son. That's nice, she answered and stared until he felt obliged to ask. Have you? I had children. Surely you still have? No. To them I'm dead. His mouth flapped uselessly until her neighbour, a woman as old and large as a hill, with bristling whiskers, shouted, What did she say you were called? Man... Manfred Gold, he stammered. That's not what she said. She turned to a gentleman sat at her other side as though he might offer more of an explanation, but he merely nodded a bald head fretted with wispy red veins and opened and closed his toothless mouth like a goldfish. Marshall took the opportunity to flee back to his preparations. Manfred Gold, he mused. The magnificent Manfred. Whatever had possessed him to chew such a stupid stage name. What's in a name, he thought. Probably not much if one couldn't remember one's own, which most of these old folk must be guilty of. Chew. A man who looked like a starved Father Christmas, carefully enunciated. Chew. Chew. Listen to him. He thinks he's a train, chortled one tiny old lady, nudging a clone of herself in the ribs. An old boiler, perhaps. A steam train. That must be why he stinks of smoke. Marshall bent lower over his preparations. It did smell strongly of smoke. He'd expected to see somebody puffing away on a pipe, or at least a fire in the half where there was only blackened stone. This place couldn't have seen a fire in many years. Chew! Chew! Won't you sit down? We're all sat down, Alfred. Won't you sit down? He wants the man to sit down. Do you want the man to sit down, Alfred? Won't you sit down? Marshall didn't want to have to turn around and become involved in increasingly mindless distractions, but he was saved by the reappearance of a colossal nurse and a smaller, wiry companion. They stood on opposite sides of a doorway, presumably not to make him feel as trapped as he did, and the smaller nurse flicked the light switch to draw attention, though in those few seconds he was reminded of flickering flames and the old faces that lined the room turned even more skull-like. Would you like a sweet? someone asked just before everyone fell silent. All right, everyone, best behaviour now. Our new friend has come a long way to amuse us tonight. Isn't that nice of him? We do hope he'll stay and give us all he's got, so let's all enjoy him and his bag of tricks now. With that, all the eyes, seeing and unseeing, were upon him, and he, he coughed nervously, having started to feel as patronised as the child the nurse must have imagined she was talking to. Faces wrinkled as dried apples bobbed towards him, paper hats slipped precariously, mouths sucked and cracked at boiled sweets or dentures. His hands fumbled on the props for his first trick. He couldn't form the knot that it required. He blundered into one of his standard jokes, but only one person laughed, and he was as unnerved by not being able to locate who it was as by them not stopping when they should. Had the nurse dimmed the lights? Certainly much bloom seemed to have been added to the room, presumably to highlight his performance, though he was finding it hard to see. At his back, the tree cast unpleasant lights, blood red, a sickly yellow or green. His shaking fingers tugged at the knot and the string opened out into two separate pieces, though this brought him only a look of such sympathy from the old twins that he had to restrain himself from telling them he hadn't broken it. 
A stupid trick, he thought as he dropped the strings to the table, hardly astonishing. He blustered through his piece with the various coloured handkerchiefs which brought a few chortles, mainly when he dropped one of them, and then into a series of card tricks. Was this the card you chose? he asked the vain-headed man, and bit his lip when he answered. Yes. No. It might have been. I can't remember. One woman in the shadows by the fireplace was rocking gleefully, almost manically hugging her knees. Another was yawning continuously, making Marshall want to do so himself. A man with a profuse beard and eyebrows, but no other hair, was scratching at the arms of his chair with unpleasantly long fingernails. In the gloom, they all looked somehow charred, he thought, and brittle as firewood. The lights from the tree threw strange casts onto the faces of those nearest to him, deepening their wrinkles, turning their skin unnatural shades. The nurses bookending the doorway felt threatening rather than reassuring. He had the ludicrous notion that when he tried to leave, they wouldn't let him and treat him as another resident. In the dim and sputtering light, he could see too much of her teeth and eyes, making them appear predatory. Somebody in the aged audience was rustling paper or sweet wrappers. He abandoned a joke halfway through and picked up a magic wand, something the children loved, and even the grown-ups usually greeted with non nostalgic laughter. But his current audience were neither. It wasn't paper rustling, he realised. It was fire, and that was what he could smell, and probably what was making him sweat, like the goose that knew it was dinner. He was being foolish. There was no fire. And if anything was making him sweat, it was the mounting intensity of a room full of gazers. Marshall became uncomfortably aware that it didn't matter how terrible his act was, because it was no longer, and perhaps never had been, the attraction. He himself seemed to be the single focus of the old folks' attention. As he performed more tricks, becoming increasingly careless with them, and caring less about it, he looked from one pair of eyes to another, and all were staring unblinkingly back at his, rather than what his hands were doing. In one pair of eyes, he thought he saw flames dancing, but it could have only been the reflection of a garish Christmas light. Another pair of eyes seemed as completely black as a spider's, no detail, no whites, no soul. But when he looked back up again, he couldn't find who they belonged to. He was going through his act almost subconsciously now. It felt like a pretense that he had to keep up. And what was worse was that he felt everyone was aware of his deception. He felt like a rabbit trying to distract a hungry wolf, in reality, just biding its time. Bones, or walking sticks, rattled in the shadows. A voice dry as ash laughed though he couldn't remember having made a joke, or indeed having said anything at all. He was booked to perform for an hour, only 40 minutes of which had so far managed to drag themselves by, but who was going to notice? With a flourish, he ended his current trick as though it was a showstopper, and the room was plunged into blackness. In that instant, he saw the old folk, even more skeletal than they were crawling through the darkness towards him, clambering over one another in their haste to get at him. Their skin loose and blackened except where their old bones seemed close to breaking through, or in some cases had already done just that. He saw the totally black eyes, domed skulls with cobweb wisps of hair, wrinkled mouths full of dentures that were more like knives. And then the absurd vision was over and the room was as well lit as it had ever been. Gnarled, knuckly hands rattled together in applause. One large woman slapped hers together so rigorously that her fleshy arms billowed like sails. A man in a blazer and a wheelchair rolled backwards and forwards, as though bumping against the wall was the most appreciation he could show.
The fellow who'd been clawing at the arms of his chair continued to do so, though his bare feet scrabbled at the carpet in excitement, and Marshall was repulsed to notice his lengthy yellow toenails digging in and bending against the floor. He had to wonder at such appreciation, and did so as he took a perfunctory bow more from habit than any show of gratitude, and began stuffing his props back into the hold all, even before the nurses called everyone to attention. The residents had seemed so unamused and even distracted during his performance that their applause seemed some overly enthusiastic way of placating him. I'm sure we'd all like to thank our special guest, Mr. Manfred Gold, for coming out to give us our pleasure tonight. The large nurse rumbled, though hadn't they done just that? It was all the thanks he required, along with his payment, and he was about to chase the latter up when a tufted pink head turned towards him and implored, Stay with us. The words repulsed him more than he could have thought possible. He, he flapped his mouth helplessly and stared towards the nurses as the call was joined by more as if it had roused them from various toothless mouths. Yes, stay a little longer. Don't go. Play a game with us. Each request was increasingly unappealing, but neither of the nurses came to his aid. As he stood with his hold all clutched to his chest like a shield, gazing to them across a sea of pleading faces that reminded him more than ever of hungry chicks in a nest, the smaller one merely said, Mr. Gold will have to decide for himself if he wants to play with us. So much about that sentence unsettled him. Not just the way she'd said his name as though he was trying to trick them all with it, but the reference to us as though they were all about to be joined in some unpleasant game. Staff, residents and visitor. He was acting foolish, he knew, just the kind of behaviour Michelle would have rolled her eyes at, and it was a thought of his ex-wife's omnipotent disapproval that encouraged him to stay a while longer. All right, he answered, and the room erupted into more applause, frail hoots, shrill cheers and general rattling. Even the large nurse was grinning and clapping meatily, and he twitched a smile of his own as some response and hoped it came across as something more than helpless. Limbs frail as kindling reached out to him. Someone took his hold all from him, but he didn't see who or where it went. What shall we play? he asked. Blind man's buff, a gruff voice muttered from somewhere behind a beard grey as cinder. His ruddy-faced neighbour waved long fingers at him. It's bluff! Buff! The idea of flailing about in the dark as blind as several as the old folk wasn't in the least appealing, but he swallowed his distaste and nodded. All right then, I'll be it, shall I? You're it, all right. He couldn't tell who'd spoken, but the small nurse was coming towards him with a length of cloth to blindfold him. As she shut off his sight, she called out, Don't all get too rowdy now. It's getting late. That's when we have the most fun, the bearded man answered, and Marshall was shut into blindness with that. His other senses must be compensating, for the scent of smoke was stronger than before. Perhaps the old folk would underestimate his hearing, though, for already he could hear a multitude of excited whispering from all around, and a rustling and crackling that could only be somebody trying to hide near the gifts around the Christmas tree. He held himself still and tried to decipher the voices as incessant and overlapping as flames. Behind him. Do you think he knows? It burns. Not yet. Let him find. He felt something like a bag of bones brushed by his leg and flinched away. Whatever it was, must have been crawling on hands and knees, though moving at a rate he wouldn't have imagined any of them capable of, even when stood up. He stepped back and bumped into something thinner than any human limb should be, 
somebody's walking stick, no doubt, and then raised his hands to ward off the impression that clawed fingers were reaching out to his face. There was a cackle from immediately behind him, so close he should have been able to feel the breath of whoever was stood there. He turned carefully and reached out, determined to at least make a pretense of playing the game, but they were as elusive as smoke. Something unpleasantly slimy pressed against his face. Surely not a kiss. It couldn't have been. To have come from such an angle, whoever had bestowed it would have had to stoop from high above him. He was walking into things, that was all. The room seemed to be closing in around him as though it had become little bigger than the darkness he'd been blindfolded into. More whispers and secretive, he tried not to believe malicious, laughter. The smell of smoke was overwhelming, but he stumbled towards the disused fireplace. He was growing hotter, but that could only be his sense of awkwardness. He lunged out as something brushed past him, and his hands closed upon something dry and scaly as burnt wood. A shrill voice screamed in his ear, but it was with pleasure. A pleasure that sounded more, than, more awful than it should to him. He whipped off his blindfold and saw a circle of old folk around him, as though closing in for the kill. He got me! chortled the crone in his grasp. He was dismayed how unlike a human she appeared. Her head may have been carved from a turnip and bewigged in candy floss. What are you going to do with me now? Marshall released her and stepped briskly backwards before he could give in to the instinct to push her away. Whose go is it now? he asked, looking beyond the ring of heads for the nurses, but they had left him to it again. He had hoped his question might prompt them into reminding the residents how late it was getting. Not that. The man who had been clawing at his chair spoke next. A different game. Hide and go seek. Yes, we like that one. We're coming to get you. Yes, hide, do. We'll count to 100. Before he had any chance to respond, the residents had all covered their eyes. Even the ones he'd assumed to be blind were in the spirit, and all started counting, more or less, in unison. More than a game, the mass chanting reminded him of some sinister ritual, and he swiped his brow with a sleeve. It really was becoming unbearably hot in here. Before they'd shouted, Five! He was pushing his way through the circle and back out into the main hallway. There was still no sign of the nurses, but at least this game got him away from the old folks' overwhelming enthusiasm, and he could breathe a little easier as long as he was out of their grasp. He took a moment to get his bearings. A doorway ahead must lead to the kitchen, judging from the heat and lingering smell of old roast meat, but he needed no more of that. The one beneath the stairs could only lead to a storeroom or a cellar, neither of which invited him. The ragged chanting reached ten as he fled to the foot of the stairs, but what was the noise he'd heard beneath the chorus of voices? If he'd been less distracted, he might have recognised it. He pushed himself up the stairs as swiftly and silently as he could, trying to recall the last time he'd played such a game. Despite himself and his racing heart, he had to suppress a grin. This wasn't all bad. Who'd have thought the old things had such life in them? The first floor was in darkness. He couldn't see a light switch, and the voices from the stairwell told him he'd used a quarter of his time. He'd waste no more of it. He tried the first door that he came to and poked his head inside, but withdrew it quickly when a shape started to squirm beneath the bedsheets in the dark. He hadn't realised any of the residents would be in their beds already. The movement had put him in mind of a giant grub disturbed beneath a rock. He hurried along the corridor and suddenly realised what the noise he'd heard had been. He was fumbling inside his pocket, even as he pushed open the next door, and so was unable to pull it shut as immediately as he should have done when he saw that this too was occupied. 
He hadn't woken this occupant, at least, for he could see a scarecrow-like silhouette already lurching about in the dimness. Marshall whispered, Sorry! as loudly as he dared, and stepped forwards to pull the door closed again. He'd assumed that the burnt orange light was coming from a street lamp beyond the window, though for a moment it had seemed to be flickering about inside the room, and he couldn't see a window anywhere in here. As he closed the door and fled deeper into the house, he pulled his mobile phone from his pocket. That's what he'd heard, all right. He'd missed another call from Michelle. His first thought was one of annoyance that she would choose to disturb him whilst he was working. Then, he worried that her doing so must mean it was serious. He'd reached the end of a corridor and hid himself behind a heavy pair of floor-length drapes that smelled smoke damage, whilst he pressed the button that would dredge up the message she'd left for him. He'd thought the drapes were curtains, but there was only a small alcove behind them. As he raised the phone, he couldn't remember seeing a single window inside the building. So many emotions churned inside of him that he felt momentarily weak and slumped back against the wall. A robotic voice gave way to his less warm ex-wife's, and the message was almost over before he could even understand what he was hearing. I've always known you to come up with some lame excuses for yourself, Roger, but I didn't think you were the type to resort to outright lying, and not to get you out of your son's birthday. The trace of hurt was so unlike her that it surprised him almost as much as whatever she was trying to tell him, and at that moment he started to feel cold for the first time since he'd arrived at the rest home. I know you'll resent me for checking up on you, but I would have been glad if just for once you'd have proved me wrong. I think we'll leave it to you to tell Jerry his own father would go to such lengths to avoid him. Her brief silence allowed him to hear a crackling which at first he thought was coming from the phone, and the numeric chanting echoing up a stairwell, increasingly excited as it neared its climax, and somehow hungry sounding. There is no gold in Ember's retirement home in Seaport, you fool. At least, there isn't any more. It burned down on Christmas fifteen years ago. The silence caved in as more than her message ended. He would have called her back to protest his innocence, to declare his love for the family that was more lost to him than it had ever been, to beg for some kind of help. But he didn't dare make a sound, for downstairs the chanting had stopped and given way to the sound of things as dry and brittle as sticks clattering up the stairs. The babble of excited laughter and unintelligible gabbling, all rushing upwards like flames. He wished he'd chosen a better hiding place where they could never have found him, and could only hope this one would somehow be good enough. They'd waited so very long for some entertainment, and now, ready or not, here they came to find him.